The following program is sponsored by Community Psychiatric Centers and is produced for educational purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute for medical or psychological advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The content should not be used for self-diagnosis or treatment of any health-related condition. As always, seek the advice of your health care provider with any questions regarding a medical or mental health condition. Welcome to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. Tonight, autism and behavioral meltdowns. What causes meltdowns? Can they be prevented? And what kind of help is available for your child? We'll look at this issue and more during Autism Awareness Month in April. But first, let's meet our experts tonight. Dr. John Carrasso is Clinical Director of Community Psychiatric Centers. He's a clinical licensed child psychologist and a certified school psychologist. And Dr. Robert Lowenstein is Medical Director of Community Psychiatric Centers. He's a board-certified child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and a fellow of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Good evening, gentlemen. Good yeah. evening. Dr. Lowenstein, <coughs> what are the <coughs> symptoms of autism, and how do these symptoms contribute to behavioral problems, including outbursts? Sure. Children with autism present with a variety of behavioral uh, symptoms which can lead to uh, the meltdowns that we talk about, which are basically temper tantrums or aggressive acting out episodes. Children with autism may present with communication problems, meaning they have difficulty in being able to verbalize feelings and thoughts. And when they're, un and when they're unable to do that, they get very frustrated that they can't get their feelings out or get their needs met, and it can lead to temper tantruming. Also, uh, children uh, with autism may present with uh, problems in socialization, meaning they can't interact with other people well, and when uh, forced to do so, or when faced with a, a frustration in their interaction with others, they may also have uh, a meltdown. Peers may tend to reject them. They may also attempt to control their social interactions with others, which, when thwarted, can lead to lots of frustration and anger. They also may need to have uh, a, a repetitive behaviors, spinning, uh, uh, twirling, which, when stopped, may lead them to become angry and also act out in that way. Uh, they also may need sameness, the same routines, and when that gets changed, they can have temper tantrums. This typically occurs in schools when, during periods of transition, a child doesn't want to leave one class or one activity and go to another one and has a temper tantrum in school and at home for that matter when they're forced to change a routine or an activity that they don't want to abandon. And also they may have sleep problems and when children have sleep problems they may get quite irritable and this can lead to them becoming quite aggressive. Dr. Carlson, what are some of the things that parents should consider when they're dealing with their autistic child's outbursts? Yeah, well, the first thing to consider is that essentially all kids tantrum. And much to the chagrin of parents, uh, I know all too well, that uh, kids tantrum typically it's a frustration response um, to limit setting of some, of some sort. The parent is setting a limit and you can't have something or do something, and then the child tantrums as a result. Now. <coughs> It's important to note, though, that, that we don't want the child to get what they want by tantruming. So two very common strategies that are used for typical children and for children with autism as well is ignoring, ignore the tantrum, hopefully just extinguish it that way, or, or something like time out, for example. And there's many other strategies to use, but those are uh, the two common ones. Now, however, for a child with autism, the the reason for the tantrum can be much more complex and multi-determined so that when we try time out or, or ignoring the uh, tantrum, sometimes that just isn't effective. Now, at Community Psychiatric, we will use what's referred to as a functional behavioral assessment. And that is a detailed assessment that does just that. It, it helps it to determine the function of the behavior so that we can get a better understanding of what is contributing to the outburst in the first place, what's sustaining it, and ultimately what can help to extinguish the, um, the tantrum. 
this is vital we can then take that the, these skills teach parents the, the, the skills so they can use this themselves to so that so they don't rely on us for that and um, and again get, get a handle on these tantrums and outbursts so dr. Lowenstein the intervention is <coughs> more toward avoiding the outburst than it is uh, any type of punishing behavior after the fact oh certainly yes it doesn't make any sense to punish a child that's had a temper tantrum when they can't express themselves or can't tell you why they got so frustrated that they had a meltdown. Uh, clearly the best approach is to prepare for the temper tantrum in advance to try to, as Dr. Russell mentioned, try to know when a child is m more susceptible to have one, in what situations it may occur, prepare for it in advance and try to avoid it if possible. So what uh, should a parent do if their child is tantruming daily? You know, maybe because they want a treat and mm -hmm. they're not getting it. Sure, and it depends. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, planned ignoring, which is simply ignoring the tantrum, or timeouts, two commonly used strategies. And if they work on a child with autism, well then that can be an ongoing option. However, as I mentioned, not uncommonly they, they don't work very well. So in those situations, we have, uh, we have a misunderstanding of the function of the behavior. Uh, we want to focus as much as we can can on trying to, to determine using the functional behavioral assessments on what is we call them antecedents what is what is happening just before the tantrum starts that's helping to, to start this this outburst in the first place now for example a parent says to a child with autism uh, you can't have a snack you have to wait until after dinner for a typical child that may, that may be okay they may tantrum but you ignore it and move on from there for a child with autism again Dr. Lomasi mentioned at the outset they may have uh, language deficits that can also mean um, it's referred to as auditory processing problems so they may not hear the words the way they're being said uh, they may also have difficulties with time after dinner, when is after dinner? I mean, I don't know. And so we may use, we may, may need to be a bit more creative. We may use what's referred to as visual schedules. Children with autism tend to learn better visually, so we'll set up a visual schedule of them carrying out their routine. It may include snack time, and then so they can see exactly when it's going to happen. We may use um, uh, more verbal prompts and reminders uh, uh, throughout the day to prepare them for, for, the, for the schedule as well. Again, the idea is to be as creative as possible and not get stuck in those traditional strategies that, that tend to not be entirely effective. Right. Also, once a child is in a full, a full-blown tantrum, it's important to keep that child safe. Oftentimes, these children end up uh, hurting themselves or someone else during the tantrum. They may bang their head against the wall or the floor. They may run into objects uh, head first. They may do all kinds of things which are quite dangerous, and that needs to be prevented, of course. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back to talk more with our doctors about autism and behavioral meltdowns right after this. You're watching Community Psychiatric Centers Presents on PCNC. Stay with us. Is your child defiant at home? Do teachers say your child refuses to behave? If this sounds familiar and your family is in crisis, we can help. I'm Dr. Robert Lowenstein. And I'm Dr. John Carrasso. At Community Psychiatric Centers, we make it our mission to quickly and effectively diagnose and treat your child so your family doesn't have to spend months on a waiting list. Call us today for a free phone consultation. An early diagnosis and proper treatment can make a world of difference in your child's life. For people with Parkinson's disease, sometimes even taking a walk in the park can be an overwhelming task. You can join thousands of others to help make that walk in the park possible. Support the annual Parkinson's Unity Walk to find a cure for Parkinson's. Call us at 866-789-9255 or go to unitywalk.org. Welcome back to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. We're talking with Dr. Robert Lowenstein and Dr. John Carrasso of Community Psychiatric Centers about autism and behavioral meltdowns tonight. And Dr. Lowenstein, you talked about this a little bit, but what if an autistic child is having these outbursts at school? What, what, how do teachers handle it? How do parents handle it if this is happening? Right, well, in general, the teachers should be trained to be able to handle these problems, and hopefully they are. 
and they should be able then to also be able to set up a behavioral program for each child in order to uh, prepare for changes in, in uh, transitions, as I mentioned, often difficult, frustrations between peers of two children playing with the same toy and they grab it from each other, or some frustration in not being able to do something that they wish to do and uh, give up an object that they want to give up, or something of that sort. You know, the plan is to try to create a, a preparedness plan for how to prevent it from happening uh, in advance and that's really the best thing to do. I want to talk a little bit more Dr. Crosso about what Dr. Lowenstein was saying about transitions mm -hmm. being difficult. What sure. types of transitions? Uh, just a, a general thing like going from reading to writing or watching TV? Yeah, a transition typically is a change in activity. So so the child is involved in one activity which could be something fun or it could be something at school for example they're involved in a writing task but then they have to change that activity, change what they're doing, and do something else, which could be anything from going to a reading assignment or going to pick up their toys. Transitions are tough. They're tough for any child. Uh, keeping in mind even typical children, when they're asked to do something, especially from an unfavored activity to a favorite activity, I'm sorry, vice versa, if they're, if they're watching television and asked to just pick up their, their toys or uh, something, that doesn't go over so well. And you see a tantrum. Well, same holds true with children with autism. It's probably even a bit, a bit more of an issue, though, given the fact that uh, children with autism uh, tend to thrive on sameness, uh, being able to be very, things being very predictable and keeping things the same. Uh, and so any change in that can result in tantrums and difficulties. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to, in order to deal with this, um, I mentioned before, before about visual schedules, so that, that they can see the schedule and what's, what's upcoming. They know that in, you know, in, uh, at this time we move from such and such to something else, and they can see it, not just hear about it. That can help a lot. We, we may uh, provide extra, extra warnings and prompts ahead of time. We may use timers, and there are also visual timers where the child can see the time elapsing. That can help as well. Keeping in mind as well that when the child does tantrum, which oftentimes they do during this transition, we're not going to feed into it. We're not going to allow them to continue doing what they were doing as a result of the tantrum. And that too can help extinguish the problem as well. Dr. Lowenstein, is medication ever effective in managing these outbursts? Well, yes, it is. Uh, actually, uh, there have been a number of studies done uh, to show that some of the psychotropic medications used in psychiatry, particularly two medications like uh, erisperidol and um, uh, Zyprexa and maybe Abilify, all can be useful in the treatment of aggression in children uh, with autism. Uh, actually, they've been approved by the FDA for this specific purpose, the first time uh, that it's been approved for this. And it can be quite effective in helping to control the level of aggressiveness in autistic children. There are other medications that have been used with less success, such as clonidine or catapress, which is a beta block, which helps to reduce aggression as well. And um, there are others uh, out there that are somewhat helpful. Uh, the choice of medication is a, has to be very carefully considered, as well as the avoidance of other medications which may make these symptoms worse. Some of the stimulants uh, given to, to autistic children can actually worsen the tantruming, so this needs to be considered. Dr. Carrasso, language was mentioned as a potential problem. Mm -hmm. How do you manage language to help a child with autism? Yeah, yes, uh, it can be a challenge because there can be uh, auditory processing deficits, as I mentioned, where a child is not exactly hearing what's being said to them. The brain is not processing uh, language being spoken to them the way that ours does. And so again, what they hear may not exactly be what was, what was said. And that can obviously be very frustrating for everybody involved and result in tantrums. They may also be rather concrete in thinking where someone says, uh, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. And they're looking for a horse, you know, again, taking it very literally. Uh, their vocabulary may be limited so that their ability to express themselves and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I'm feeling, it, that can be a challenge if they can't do that. So we want to speak to, to children with autism in simple terms, avoiding abstract concepts. We want to speak possibly in briefer sentences, sh shorter phrases. Uh, we want to avoid slang. We want to use one-step directions. Uh, we may emphasize nonverbal communication, uh, exaggerated affect, uh, again, a big smile or something along those lines to really communicate how we're feeling and what we're thinking. The, uh, we want to maybe accentuate various words or, or, or intonation. Those uh, small things can make a big difference in helping a child with language deficits understand what's being said and then avoid the tantrum. Mm. Sometimes we use uh, some techniques such as holding a child who's you know, having a tantrum that helps the 
calm them down or they have to wear a helmet to protect their heads or some suit uh, that tends to bind them closely, a vest, can be very helpful in uh, helping to calm the child and also to reduce the dangerousness. Yeah, we said at the top of the show that April is Autism Awareness Month. Uh, what does that mean, do you think, to the community as a whole? Because I think there was a period when people thought of autism as just affecting a certain segment in the society. Mm -hmm. But as we see in all the news reports, you know, one out of 150 children in this country, and that mm -hmm. might not even yeah. be accurate. It might well, be... Yeah, well, I, I mean, clearly it's a very uh, per pervasive condition. Uh, it occurs throughout our society. It's very important that they have this Autism Awareness Month now going on. Uh, in April, I think uh, it'll help families and people at large to understand uh, the risks of the condition um, and uh, what needs to be done to identify when a child has it and how to receive the best treatment as quickly as possible, which is the most important thing. And the goal of this show, among many programs that will be going on over the course of this month, is to educate parents and the community in so many aspects of autism, including the autism spectrum, the idea that, that there are children with autism who are quite compromised and who maybe have severe language deficits, but then there are children with autism who are higher functioning and quite high functioning and are able to have full conversations and, and present very well in many respects. And so helping helping the community so, so that when they approach a child in the grocery store and they seem the child seems a little unusual, that they're better able to be sensitive to, to, to that child and, and what, may, what may be going on between the parent and that child at that time. For example, say with a tantrum, for example, and, uh, and be more aware also um, how to uh, understand the warning signs, where to get treatment, um, what are the outcomes for the treatment. And those are things that we discuss in this program and even more over the course of this month that could be very helpful. Mm -hmm very important for the families to become empowered mm -hmm. to be able to take charge of their of the care of their child mm -hmm. and know how to get it and I would think that even you know first responders to scenes and incidents too you know mm -hmm. police for example you know if you come right. up onto a scene and it's a child who they may not know mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. autistic it's vital for it for uh, mm -hmm. fire uh, fighters and police officers do a special training because if they approach a person walking down the street uh, who appears disoriented and unusual and saying bizarre things, they may think that this person is under the influence or who knows what. But recognizing the signs of autism can be very effective so that they can properly manage the situation. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back to look at some other children's health issues in the news right after this. You're watching Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. If you have a question for the doctors, you can always give them a call also at 1-877-899-6500. Stay with us. Do you have a child, adolescent, or teenager who is having trouble at home, in the community, or at school? Call Community Psychiatric Centers for help. I work as a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist. My partner, Dr. Lowenstein, he's a board-certified child psychiatrist. Together, along with our professional staff at CPC, we're prepared to meet any family mental health need when they need it most. When a child is in crisis, when a child is suffering, when a child is in pain, a family is in pain and a family suffers. And our goal is to relieve that pain and find the child where they are and help the family to heal. And that's the basis of our program, is to help families to heal. For a free phone consultation, call Community Psychiatric Centers today at 1-877-899-6500. And watch Community Psychiatric Centers Presents, Wednesdays at 7.30 on PCNC. Community Psychiatric Centers, connecting you, your community, your world, one family at a time. to Community Psychiatric Centers Presents. We're talking with Dr. John Carrasso and Dr. Robert Lowenstein of Community Psychiatric Centers about um, behavioral problems and autism. And also, uh, here's something else on the subject of autism. The next big autism bomb, one in 50 kids are potentially at risk. That is huge. 
Iraq. What are they basing that on? Well, they're basing it on the fact that uh, on March the 11th, there was a uh, conference that was held uh, between the CDC and experts in vaccine safety research, as well as some drug companies and insurance plans. And they were really talking about the risks of uh, autism. And what came out during the conference was that there are now, what has come out as a result of the uh, Hannah Poling case, which we've heard about where this young child experienced a regression in her autistic type symptoms following a vaccine and was found to have a mitochondrial type disorder. Anyway, the study seemed to indicate that there are many children potentially with autism who have similar uh, mitochondrial disorders. The percentages can go up to maybe 20% or more of autistic children having problems with a mitochondrial disease. If this pans out to be the case, obviously it opens up the whole question of uh, how one has to test for this condition in early children. It also opens up the whole theory of whether or not vaccines can cause harm to the mitochondrial process in the body. Uh, things to look for in the future. Yeah. Even in the years since we started doing the show, this issue keeps coming up again yes. and again, yes. and there's always a different spin on it depending upon what time, yeah. you know, what the study's showing at that point. Yeah, but research. this is big right now because this is going to be the next, <coughs> next thing to be researched closely. All right. Yeah. Dr. Carrasso, this is an interesting <laughs> one. I'm sure moms can probably yeah. agree with yeah, this, but moms and tots argue 20 times an hour. Yeah, there was a, a recent study in the in child development uh, who found that actually the range was between four times per hour and 55 times per hour. Okay. Now, actually, I, I wanted to talk about this because for, for a few reasons. One is possibly mothers or parents can take some some comfort in knowing they're not alone and they're in their distress, uh, knowing that that it's not uncommon for toddlers to be difficult and and to, to bicker and to, you know to cause fuss and and so that's something that is is commonplace. However. Uh, a study like this with this type of, of finding could very easily make it into the mainstream and uh, it's somewhat questionable in, in some respects keeping in mind that if you're talking for example 55 times per hour that's say one a minute I mean that's that's outrageous um, one does question what were they what were they terming an argument you know uh, how did they define that if, if a parent redirected their toddler and the toddler said said no and then a second later did whatever they were told to do was that an argument? I mean, that's 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 a commonplace interaction between a mother and and the, and the toddler. Um, and so again, uh, the, the bottom line from the study is that again, uh, difficulties with toddlers is commonplace. Whether it's 55 times per hour is is is, is questionable. But it's something that parents can take note of, that if they're struggling with their toddler and having a rough time, they can always give us a call and we can talk about it. And one of the things that we do during evaluations is try to get a sense uh, the extent to which this is normal or abnormal and help parents to, to be comforted if it is within a normal range and if it's not, then take action accordingly. All right. Dr. Lowenstein, girls with ADHD face risks as adults, more so than boys? Well, yes, there's a study that just came out in the uh, archives of general psychiatry, a study done in London uh, showing that uh, girls as young as the age of six, they did a study between six and twelve, who were diagnosed as having ADHD and aggression would later on be at risk for having some behavioral patterns which were quite concerning, including the choice of partners in adulthood that may have been abusive to them, uh, poor school performance, and uh, problems in their job also pregnancies, things of that nature. This is not at all uh, surprising. Obviously, children with aggression who are allowed to continue to be aggressive into teenage years are going to have some behavioral problems into adulthood. This does lead, though, to the conclusion that it's very important to do early intervention in children, especially girls, with ADHD and aggression so that they don't develop these patterns of behavior into adulthood. All right, Dr. Crosso, <coughs> suicide warning signs for college students. We hear so much. Yes, yes there was some, some recent work out of Columbia re-emphasizing the fact that, this is something we've talked about on the show before, is that you know, as, as children, as teenagers, not children, as teenagers approach late adolescence, many of the mental disorders, mental health issues uh, that, that we speak of, uh, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, serve 
surface for the first time in these late teenage years. It may very well be no coincidence that this is also a time when, when kids are moving on to college. Probably the most stressful thing that they're going to do it up to that point in their life. And uh, it's not uncommon at all that we get referrals just, just this past week, I can think of one off the top of my head, where a uh, 19 year old uh, going away to college and things just don't go well and they, they really struggle and have a rough time uh, with their mood and with their uh, become withdrawn and so it's really important for parents during this time in a child's life especially if there's a family history of mental health problems or if the child has a history of mental health issues that they uh, take special notice and, and, and precautions and uh, maintain tabs with the child some things that they want to take note of is any signs such as um, uh, withdrawal from other people talking about hurting themselves keeping in mind that people who are going to hurt themselves not uncommonly talk about it and it's okay also to ask uh, if, if, if you're starting to get these warning signs to ask the, the adolescent are you thinking of hurting yourself people who are thinking of hurting themselves will talk about it typically and will say yes I'm having these thoughts and, and they can take it from there in terms of, of asking about uh, uh, how long this has been going on for and talking about if they have a plan and, and, and this nature. However, the, the more important point is that if they're starting to get to the point where the parent is concerned and worried that they call us. I mean, this is something where professional intervention is vital. We're not playing games here. This is something to take very, very seriously, whether it be for suicidal issues or for a child who's having a psychotic break, uh, any number of things that, that, that can surface at this time for parents to, to, to play pay special uh, precaution to this. All right. We're going to take a short break. Uh, again, that number, if you do need to call, is one 877 6500 And the website where you can find more information is cpcwecare.com. We'll be right back. Is your child defiant at home? Do teachers say your child refuses to behave? If this sounds familiar and your family is in crisis, we can help. I'm Dr. Robert Lowenstein. And I'm Dr. John Carrasso. At Community Psychiatric Centers, we make it our mission to quickly and effectively diagnose and treat your child so your family doesn't have to spend months on a waiting list. Call us today for a free phone consultation. An early diagnosis and proper treatment can make a world of difference in your child's life. I am voting for more compassion and less shock and awe. I'm Adam Goldberg, and I'm voting for more diplomacy and less war. I'm voting to elect a president that doesn't think that war is the only avenue to peace. I am voting for leaders who can truly protect us from danger without compromising our freedom. I'm voting for an America that is respected the world over. I'm voting for my rights. I'm voting for everything this country truly stands for. We can make a difference. What are you voting for? Tell us at takepart.com slash Chicago 10. Back to Community Psychiatric Centers presents a few final questions for our doctors. Uh, this is an email from one of the viewers. My seven-year-old daughter is diagnosed with autism, ADHD, OCD, Tourette's, and a seizure disorder. A stimulant has been prescribed, but I am reluctant to give it to her. What are the potential dangers given all those diagnoses? Well, obviously, the first thing uh, to do is to make sure the diagnosis is correct. So it's very important if you are concerned about the diagnosis is to get a second opinion to make sure that, that you're not misdiagnosing your child. The other thing is in terms of the stimulant, stimulants are known to make, at times, to make some of the symptoms of autism worse. They can make the child more irritable and aggressive. They also can cause a worsening of Tourette's type ticking. And so because of those two conditions and problems, you have to be careful and using the stimulant. All right. Dr. Lowenstein, Dr. Crosso, nice to see you again, to have you here, and thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.